This is in accordance. Uh, let me first uh, start introducing the program, and then I will introduce uh, Professor Muhammad Abu Nimer from the University of American University and Professor Dr. Lam Nasser uh, from uh, Washington DC from the University of American University. And uh, first, I uh, would like to say welcome, everyone. This is an Erasmus Plus uh, program co-funded uh, by the European Union. It's a, a workshop of exchange knowledge where we exchange knowledge of different professors every week in a discussion, uh, open discussion on reconciliation, conflict transformation, and peace education in the Middle East and North Africa. At this session, we are welcoming Professor Muhammad uh, Abu Nima from American University. And he is a very well known professor for his work in Forgiveness in Islam and one of his famous books, uh, Reconciliation, Coexistence. Uh, I read your book, Professor, and I think it's, one of, it's a masterpiece. And I also would like uh, to welcome uh, Professor Ilham Nasser. She's the, she's the director of the Human Development Program and a senior researcher at the International Institute of the Islamic Thought. Welcome, professors. I will not speak a lot about you, so you can introduce yourself. And this is the floor is for you. And I will uh, back up for uh, one hour, and then we have half an hour for, for like a break, 15 minutes or 10 minutes for break. And then we have another half an hour or 45 minutes of discussion and questions. Thank you both for attending uh, this session. And I, I tell you that a lot of people will come in. While they come in, I will, uh, I will not introduce them. They'll just enter into the program. And then we can, uh, anyone who wants to ask his question, he can introduce himself for like one minute and then ask his question and the discussion phase. So professors, I welcome you both of you into this program and I'm happy to have you and have all these uh, people with us here in our MENA PhD program. Thank you for attending and thank you for giving us your time. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Um, and uh, glad to be with you. I have heard a lot so far from both Martin and uh, Dr. Iyad about uh, the program, and I'm delighted to finally make it and uh, see some of the familiar faces and also meeting new faces here. Uh, I have been in, uh, in the university and in the program in the center with uh, Iyad, um, uh, I think about three years ago or four, four years ago in the first uh, MENA region, uh, Arab uh, Middle East Region Reconciliation Network meeting and uh, always been looking forward to uh, come back and uh, work with the program um, and uh, delighted to see uh, many of you here as well. So again, I'm Mohamed Abu Nimer, professor at the AU, been working in this field for many years and uh, mainly conflict zone area from of course, all the Arab region, as well as Sri Lanka, Philippines, Mindanao, um, Northern Ireland, and mostly Nigeria, Niger, and Chad. All of these areas have done some workshops and training in different uh, themes and different areas. But all of the themes really uh, connected with the notion of identity-based conflicts and in zones where there, there are conflicts, violent in most cases, where people deal with each other uh, in, a, in a violent way to settle their identity-based issues. Um, and uh, the, the idea for today is to share with you maybe three pieces. The first piece is the link between forgiveness and reconciliation. And then the second piece is about uh, our research that we did with Dr. Ilham Nasser uh, for almost from 2007 or eight now. We've been doing this for 10, 11 years together, uh, writing and doing research on forgiveness. And um, also Dr. Ilham has a new research that she started with Triple IT, International Institute for Islamic Thought, uh, where she did a research, she'll talk about it further. She's going to share with you also a related results. So this is really cutting edge part you're getting from Ilham because she just finished. We just ran the, the, the SPSS analysis uh, two days ago, and the results are very fresh. You're probably the first group that she's going to share the results with you. And then we will end with the third segment of uh, 
this notion of uh, working on reconciliation and forgiveness in the Arab region and what does it mean and uh, implications, um, implications and obstacles. These are the three components we want to share with you. Uh, I'll do the first segment and the third one, and then um, Ilham will do the, Dr. Nasser will do the second, the, the second one. Um, well, actually, yeah, so those, those are the two. Um, any word, uh, Ilham, before I start? No, but I would like to just, no, and yes, <laughs> just one point to say that, um, in our work, and when we're looking at forgiveness, reconciliation, if you imagine the, I don't know if you're familiar with Bronfebrenner um, ecosystems and how people are influenced from the beginning, from the individual all the way to the larger society and the world and so forth. So what we do together here is to complement each other from, the, from our expertise. I come from the education, psychology, human development, child development perspective, while Dr. Abu Nimer comes to it from the political science, international relations, culture, religion, and so forth. So I think what you're gonna get here is a, a little bit of a mixture of both. We were trying to understand what forgiveness is and how it relates to reconciliation from these different entry points into the social, political, uh, cultural, community, individual, all of these different layers of who we are. So. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So yeah, I'm going to share the screen. And um, uh, if you have any comments or questions, you know, we can get, get to them, but probably it's good, at, I think in the beginning to have a chance, uh, have a chance at least to um, just share with you the, the gist of the hypothesis and theories we work with. Um, just give me a sign if the screen is clear and you can see it, right? Yes, excellent. Uh, I'm just gonna do this. Yeah, terrific. So just a quick introduction. We both work with the created and work with Salam Institute, which is an entity that created 2001 here in Washington DC area. And we've done much of our work on religion peace building and uh, reconciliation, forgiveness, mostly capacity building on dialogue. And we've had a number of fellows actually with us throughout the years. We work in uh, Pakistan, uh, Iraq, um, all the Arab region as uh, Egypt, Jordan, Palestine, and also in Africa, the countries I mentioned earlier, Chad, Niger, Burkina Faso as well. That's the main uh, um, the main brunt of it. And it's based here in DC. We have several fellows and consultants who work with us. And I'm happy to engage any of you who's interested in working in these areas with Salam as well. Um, and we have a, an upcoming major research that we're going to launch uh, in, the, in the region as well. Um, so again, um, in, in the field, uh, uh, in the field of reconciliation and forgiveness, the link between them is really problematic and uh, debatable and also not clear. And it's not by mistake that your program avoided the mentioning of forgiveness in the title or in the program, but they focus on reconciliation. However, as you see from those two photos, you see forgiveness uh, under reconciliation is there on the left side, my left side. Um, but in the forgiveness part, you don't see reconciliation. Um, I, I, again, I'll talk about that in, in a minute or two, but basically the link between them is not uh, as a clear uh, academically, intellectually, uh, also in the practice. But there are a number of assumptions that we have when we deal with these things, with, with the two of them together that reconciliation and forgiveness process, they're similar in their nature and dynamic on the interpersonal as well as in the collective. We should not separate them totally because there are lots of overlap between them. Uh, the second assumption, culture and religious norms and values 
determine the process, expression, and nature of reconciliation and forgiveness. If you're in Japan and China, uh, and then you are in Lebanon, and you're trying to talk about reconciliation and forgiveness, in particular forgiveness, the processes will be different and the expressions of those will be different, and the narrative, al uh, khitab, yani, will be will be the way we describe it, al khitab, how the it will be different in due to the cultural and religious norm, and this is important assumption because it means we should not take what the German think uh, reconciliation is and try to take it to Lebanon or Palestine or Yemen or any other place and try to implement it as it is without us thinking about the cultural and the religious norms. It will be immediately rejected. I have a work in Gaza between 93 and 2000 before we were prevented or, or blacklisted by the Israeli and not to be able to go in. But for seven years, we struggled with this issues, not reconciliation, but mostly peace building uh, due to cultural and religious norms uh, that are local when some of us were trying to uh, adopt and implement um, Western, Northern uh, models of uh, peace building. So we should keep that in mind as a, as a major assumption in my view as well. There are many successful examples on interpersonal but we have very few cases on large scale. So yes, you can find many reconciliation and forgiveness example. We collected, um, and Ilham will talk about this later on, uh, over 85 cases of forgiveness in the Arab region uh, through our research. Uh, and those were all interpersonal. But the first question that people ask us when we talk about this, can you give us example between two countries? Can you give a successful Example, and then we we all sort of we all stutter <laughs> uh, coming up with with such example. There are very few example. Uh, we talk about Germany, France, I talk about European Union, but again, these are examples that one can debate. Uh, the notion of justice is also crucial in the way we redefine and reframe our sense of justice, and that's a condition. That is a necessary condition for reconciliation to take place, uh, but not necessarily for forgiveness, but definitely for reconciliation. Um, um, in order to reach a reconciliation spot, a process to engage in the process, the notion of justice has to be reframed and redefined by the parties involved. Reconciliation are, and forgiveness are not collective decision. They are individual decision. Yani, you cannot have a political leader or religious leader or, you know, the, uh, when, when, when what's his name, uh, Clinton went to uh, West Africa, Ghana, and he stood there in, on the shores of Ghana, I think, uh, and he said, I apologize for what we did to the African people by enslaving and uh, with the trade uh, slaves. He did that as the head of the US uh, government, but that did not register among people here. It did not register much among people in Ghana as well. To forgive and to reconcile is an individual decision. The collective will help, but the collective is not necessarily um, sufficient or enough to do that. Reconciliation, it's basically, you know, in, in its working decision, it's a new arrangement for of inclusion to guarantee respect and acceptance of identity-based diversity, religious, ethnic, racial, regional, and it is restoring and enhancing social cohesion on individual and collective level. Those are the two components we chose to include in the process of reconciliation. So it's about a new arrangement for inclusion and diversity for these identities. And also it's social cohesion. It's more of an enhancing social cohesion among, among people. So you have a dominating a group in Lebanon or in Yemen or in Palestine or in Egypt and, or in Iraq. And that dominating group determined, for example, during Saddam in Iraq, uh, Saddam and his groups uh, controlled the public space. And all the resources in the public space reflected 
what he thinks the proper identity of the country. So in reconciliation, there need to be negotiation about this public space. And the second, creating public and private space that encourage equal access. So reconciliation is about constructing that public and the private space in the life of everyone in the country in order to have equal access and sense of belonging, uh, to have a shared civic identity. That's what reconciliation is about. It's a, the practicality of it is really to break the domination, uh, domination of one group over the other. Uh, whatever that domination is, whether it is gender or ethnicity or religion or whatever it is. And that's, you know, that's the dance. I know Zenat is from Lebanon. That's the dance for, in Lebanon that's been taking place for over 100, 120 years. Who will control the public space and how they going to deal with that? And that's a very practical, that's our practical uh, definition. Linking and delinking reconciliation and forgiveness. As I said, there's problematic link between them. So collective and individual reconciliation, in our view, genuine reconciliation is not possible without forgiveness. And that's highly debatable statement, by the way. So you should, you should know. But we're making these statements because we are assuming that on individual level, and I'll give you a very quick example here. And I know sometimes I take too long uh, for this example. If husband and wife are fighting over the kids, and they, have a, they had a fight, they had violence among them uh, over the kids, over work, over money, over their life. And then they decide to reconcile without forgiveness. It means they are coexisting. They're living peacefully, but they're not necessarily forgiving each other. And they will resume their life. And they will continue with maybe a more peaceful life, but not necessarily forgiving each other. It's only when they decide to engage in forgiveness process, when the genuine, in, in our view, or in my view, Ilham can also, uh, um, again, debate that. Uh, that's when the reconciliation take place. Um, I'm, I'm referring here because reconciliation can be limited in its defi definition. The reconciliation between uh, two countries, two individuals, can be on the agreement that we are going to be fair, equal, the space will be shared. But whatever in my heart against you is not going to be um, said, shared, removed, or dealt with. That's the first statement. Holistic and transformational approach. Uh, here I release you and myself from the burden of wrongdoing. That's the forgiveness part. That's the holistic and transformational approach. And it has number of component forgiveness, acknowledgement of the harm that has done. And reconciliation does not have to do that. Recognition of the wrongdoing. Reconciliation does not have to do that. Taking responsibility of what has been done. Remorse, regardless whether intended or not. Remorse, yani, tawbe, aw, 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 shu'ur bil, bil, bil asaf, lal, hasal. A promise, guarantee not to repeat the offense, which is could be part of the reconciliation, but it's certainly part of the forgiveness. Granting unilateral or a mutual forgiveness. Yani forgiveness can be unilateral. I have a fight with Ilham, for example, and I'd say, you know what? I'm going to forgive you regardless what you will do, whether you acknowledge the wrongdoing or not, whether you um, acknowledge the harm or not, whether you take responsibility or not, whether you feel uh, regret or remorse or not, I am forgiving you. And that's unilateral. I have decided this. But then there is also mutual forgiveness where me and her will forgive each other because, and then there are many reasons. Unilateral forgiveness exists. Many examples we found people talk about unilateral. I forgive him or her, and God will, will God, they'll be accountable in, uh, when they face God or, or with, in, with God. Um, linking and delinking again. Reconciliation, individual and collective, is possible, as I said before, without forgiveness. 
and you have some component here uh, uh, of forgiveness that I've already mentioned. But there is no public forgiveness in the reconciliation. You can still have those component in reconciliation. The second type of reconciliation is the, the first one, A, is one type. And this is, I think, the more called the transformational, more holistic approach to reconciliation, where there is more overlap with forgiveness, but it's not necessarily with forgiveness. The second one is a pragmatic, living together, common interest-based approach, political regulation to ensure common interest. That's really the, the this is the minimal. In, in, in a book I did in 2000 on reconciliation, uh, Kreisberg and uh, Galtung described that as a coexistence. And, uh, you live with them. Uh, it's like the Israeli used to tell the Palestinians inside Israel, uh, it's our destiny to live together. We don't want to live together. We don't like that, but it's our destiny. So we'll tolerate you and you tolerate us because we have no other option. And that's a pragmatic living together. That's because of interest-based approach. In Lebanon, sometimes they use the same terminology and the same framing. Um, forgiveness, again, it requires, reconciliation requires two sides, but it takes only one for forgiveness. Reconciliation requires framing of your own sense of justice. I mentioned that earlier. Um, Reconciliation requires a change in behavior of the other. Yeah, you cannot talk about reconciliation in language. We have to have actions in order to prove that there is a reconciliation. Forgiveness does not mean you have to reconcile as well. Forgiveness is not giving up justice. Forgiveness is recognizing the hurt and uh, beyond it as well. The factors that affect reconciliation, I'm leaving uh, forgiveness behind, and these are the factors for reconciliation. The timing. You yani need to talk about reconciliation now between uh, Ukraine and Russia. It's early for everybody in that sense. We are in the middle of the war, and it, it is difficult for you to find people who will listen to you during the midst of the war and the violence to deal with reconciliation. Many people assume you have to have end the violence and then you can talk about reconciliation. I will debate that. I think even during the violence, especially toward the end of that phase of violence, you can begin to talk about reconciliation. And I think you should talk about reconciliation throughout the war as well. Scale and scope of victimhood, how much victimhood is happening. And, uh, um, again, uh, reconciliation in Nazi Germany versus reconciliation uh, in, in Granada between in the Falklands, between Britain and, and, uh, and uh, over these islands as well. Uh, and a small, less harmful, less damage, less victims uh, will allow reconciliation to move faster. But if you have a heavy sense of victimhood and injury, it will be more difficult. Involve large and collective small group. Uh, how big is it in terms of the involvement? Um, the nature of the political agreement that was reached, was it comprehensive? Yani was it Oslo? Was it Dayton uh, in, in uh, Bosnia? Uh, was it the Good Friday Agreement? Was it the apartheid removal of South Africa? The nature of the agreement will depend and determine how fast people will engage in reconciliation. Some political agreement opened the path to reconciliation better than others. Um, will you access the past? Do you want to remember, revisit the past or not? In Spain, for example, they decided not to. Uh, in, in Guatemala, they decided not to. In Chile, they, they partially visited the past. Um, again, that's a very important um, segment. In Lebanon, they decided not to visit the past. Uh, in Yemen, in their, initially, when, before the war, they decided not to visit the past. Many of the Arab countries decided not to visit the past when they engage in the national dialogue processes. Finally, justice mechanism. Again, do you want justice with restorative or punitive? Punitive, yani, um, uh, restorative, in, in the, uh, to restore is to rebuild the relationship. Versus you are interested in punishing them. 
uh, you're interested in, in putting punishment on them. These are the factors that decide whether the person or the group will engage in that. Many of us in the Arab region and in, in the world in general are caught in the inner cycle of revenge. Aggression starts, and then you go through the processes and you caught into this uh, cycle. And then at some point you decide, you individually, you decide to break away from this cycle. من هاي الدائرة الداخلية تخرج إلى دائرة المصالحة والمسامحة. ولكن الكثير من الناس يبقوا كوت يعني عالقين في دائرة الصراع ودائرة العنف ودائرة الانتقام ودائرة الرغبة في إنه الحصول على العدالة المطلقة أو أو الشعور في إنهن to feel that they are victims but they are caught into that cycle. How do we get out of the cycle? That's the major question that we all deal with it. And we are offering here, or I'm offering, it's an individual decision, individual collective decision. And all the six items that I shared with you before here, they will determine if the person will be able to get out of this cycle or not. Um, why do we forgive? Because we love people. It's unconditional because God told us, because the prophet told us, because my, our mother told us, our father. And this is the type of unconditional forgiveness as an act of love. But you also have forgiveness as an out of duty. God told us to forgive. Our religion tells us to forgive. And there is also forgiveness as an act of self-interest. Not God and not my mother, but it's good for me. Healthier. I'm tired of it. I forgive them and then I will move forward. These are the three types that we found in research. Ilham will talk about the Arab, uh, Arab region and the results that we have. We have in 11 countries in the Arab region dealing with issues of transitional justice where forgiveness and reconciliation has to take place. Syria, Sudan, Somalia, Tunisia, Leb Lebanon, Libya, Iraq, Egypt, Morocco, Algeria, Lebanon. All of these countries in the Arab region are dealing with transitional justice, which means they have to make a stop at reconciliation. Otherwise, they'll continue to be like Somalia and Afghanistan for the next 200, 300, 400 years, unless in our view, they make a stop in the reconciliation and forgiveness station. This is one of the Arab Sulha. We can talk about that later on. I want to stop here and Ilham, the floor is yours. I took... Uh, uh, 20, 20 minutes, 22 minutes. It's okay. Bitmoon, Abu Ayman, Bitmoon. Thank you. <laughs> Do you so, want to share or should I stop? No, you, you keep going. Just keep this one. Yeah, I'll, okay. I'll move. Thank you. So, um, there's a lot in what uh, uh, Muhammad shared with us today, and in terms of like uh, the definitions, the types, the linkages with reconciliation. And there's a lot to unpack. And uh, my piece here is to talk about the empirical research because part of unpacking is really understanding how do we perceive forgiveness, for me, forgiveness as an act of letting go, as an act of uh, uh, feeling better physically because a lot of research suggests that if you are letting go, if you are uh, forgiving people without any strings attached, without the reconciliation piece, you can actually have better well-being, better peace with yourself, but you will feel physically better as well. So to unpack that, there is this empirical uh, uh, piece that comes into play. And as you all know from being academics yourselves and from being from the region, you know how difficult it is to and challenging it is to uh, conduct research in MENA, and that's empirical research when so many places will not even let you go in. And I'm not gonna talk about the outside factors. The outside factors maybe are responsible for why we have 20, 12 Arab countries in such a disarray and a mess. Maybe the outside factors are also um, not helping us in understanding what's happening with people on the ground with forgiveness and reconciliation. But let's leave that out and say, how about us as people? Where do we really um, 
respond well to forgiveness? What does it mean for many of us to let go? And where is it that we cannot let go? So this is the research that we've been conducting since the beginning of the 2000, like Dr. Abu Nimr just mentioned. And part of it, we just wanted to open the door for research, for doing empirical research, whether it's quantitative, qualitative, it really doesn't matter because it will help us understand what's going on on the interpersonal level. But we also engage, have been engaged in measure development because that's one of the sensitivities that uh, Professor Abinimer just mentioned. How do you really go take notions of forgiveness? And it has a lot of theological, of course, uh, aspects, psychological aspects, philosophical aspects. How do you take it from a Northern American or Western uh, platform into our region, our societies, our culture, and our uh, religions? So what we started is a, a survey of some teachers. We wanted to see, okay, let's start with the educators. What's happening in schools? And we included um, about 700 surveys. We included in-person interviews with some of these people. And we looked at stories, analysis of stories that people provided. And here I wanna say something about each one of those. One is, of course, as you all know, and I don't think this changed much since we collected this data, there is no curriculum or even class time where K to 12, and I would also say in higher ed, we talk about forgiveness or contain lessons about forgiveness and, and even reconciliation. And people, most of the teachers told us, we really don't even know how do we teach really? Is it possible to teach forgiveness? And the answer is yes, because we know from research here where they had intervention control groups in some of the Wisconsin schools and some other states by major leading experts on forgiveness that they did find the difference in terms of the teaching that people who were taught the skills related to forgiveness were able to let go more than those who were not. And then when we asked, we were thinking, okay, who are your uh, symbols and who are your leaders in forgiveness when we ask teachers? And of course, most of the teachers were going back to their religion and religious stories to say, uh, the prophet uh, was my uh, symbol, uh, other you know, figures, uh, Jesus was my uh, figure of forgiveness. And so if when we interviewed teachers, they couldn't even come up with a modern forgiveness figure in the Arab world. Someone said, you know, Abu Ammar. Okay, let's think about Abu Ammar as a forgiveness figure. Um, he is, he stands and stood for maybe justice. Yeah, but I don't know about forgiveness and if Oslo is forgiveness. I leave that question to Muhammad. I'll stay on the interpersonal on, on that. But also in our survey, we found that people were not willing to forgive when it had to do with harm to relatives, close friends, or family. And that was about 89% of the participants. To give you an idea on who, who were those people, Muhammad Abu Nimr, please uh, move on. Just to give you an idea of who were the teachers we surveyed, we were in Lebanon, we had about 100. Uh, people in Jordan and Palestine. We had uh, two groups in Palestine, some who were within historic Palestine and somewhere in the West Bank, and then Egypt, and uh, these were the main, and then Iraq, but we, we, we did not include Iraq in this uh, uh, data set, analysis of the data set. Now, of course, in the Arab world, if you are interested in quantitative research, we are not, of course, looking at representative samples because we cannot survey everyone, every teacher, every uh, region in each of the countries. You could say that this is an inconvenient sample, but we can still learn about these teachers that we surveys, uh, surveyed, those about 700 of them. So this gives you, uh, uh, you know, just an idea of how many males, females we had across, we had more, uh, females than males, we had different religions, we had different, mostly an educated sample of university instruct with university education, 98 among Palestinians had university degrees. Um, many of them were married, had children, and they were 
in the older age group, if I rec recall correctly. If I wanna, if we wanna present our results and remember this is not a representative sample of the region, but this is how our results could be looked at in terms of the willingness to forgive or not. And one of the questions we asked, which was really surprisingly controversial was about uh, a neighbor. We asked the participants, um, this, this measure was developed at George Mason University, was never published, but we took it, adapted it, and definitely changed it so much that it could be ours, and we now use it in different uh, studies. So you, we used it here, and one of the questions was, okay, so if you are invited to your neighbor's uh, son or daughter's wedding, you go and you bit um bilwajib, like we say, you take gifts, you take whatever, haruf, awe, and uh, other things, rice maybe you take with you. And then when um, you invited your neighbor to your own child's wedding, the neighbor comes with empty hand. Will you forgive the neighbor? Will you not forgive and why? This one was significantly different across these groups you see here. Some people were upset about this and said, this is not okay, that my neighbor does not respect me and so forth. And then there's another one that we inserted kind of intentionally, which was also um, interestingly, significantly different across the scale that you see here in, in this chart. We asked people that if you had a daughter or a son, a daughter, sorry, if you had a daughter, she was almost engaged. We didn't want to say had a boyfriend, girlfriend in, in some context. So we said almost engaged to someone. And this someone just all of a sudden left her. This question we had a lot of resistance to. They were not willing, of course, to forgive. But there's a, we got lots of comments on the survey. This is not appropriate in our context and all of that. And we intentionally wanted to know what people thought about you know, these kinds of relationships between women, men, and, um, and families. And then we had few others where you asked specifically about religion. You were in a gathering and someone cursed your religion in front of you or cursed someone else's religion in front of you and what would your response be? Will you forgive or not? So this is just gives you an idea on how we've been developing this measure and how people responded to this. As you see here in your um, uh, graph. Yeah, sorry, maybe also about the property, the destroy a property, a built a, a wall between the two neighbors. Yeah, that was another, another example that uh, was interesting. And these are all scenarios that we added that came from our region. So the one Mohammed talks about is that someone decided to build a wall or a fence between his property and yours. How do you respond to that? And when he did that, he went like a, less than a meter into your property. In Palestine, where we come from, uh, there's lots of fights, even among family members over, you took a meter from my land. No, I took one, you know, all of that is, is very, uh, sensitive to people because it relates to property, something close to me and my own dignity in some cases. So in, if you see this here, you would see, oh, okay, so Lebanon were the most willing to forgive in our sample. So don't generalize, please. In our sample, Lebanese teachers were the most willing to forgive, followed by Palestinians from uh, Israel, historic Palestine, followed by Egypt in the middle, and then Palestinians 67 and Jordan were the least forgiving. When we initially shared these results, we had our team um, members in the uh, research from Lebanon and from Jordan. And of course, the, the one of the Jordanian principals who were there, he was a school principal. He immediately said, oh yes, of course, we have more dignity than the Lebanese. We don't forgive that's something that has to touch our honor and you know so he took pride in, be, in being less forgiving but at the same time he was shaming the Lebanese representative by telling him you guys are not men you know so so there's a lot of that 
cultural connotations to how you interpret research results in our region. And of course, I think that's typical of other places as well. But in our study, it, it really meant that this is not enough. We need to even dig deeper. And that's where we conducted the interviews to learn more about these trends that we saw in the surveys. So if you don't mind, the next one. So we included some questions related to people and how they perceive forgiveness, but also related to motivations. Do they teach it? How do they teach it if they do? And the symbols question that I mentioned was also asked in the interviews, about 80 interviews in these countries. We did not interview in Iraq, but we interviewed in Lebanon, Egypt, and uh, Palestine, and uh, Jordan. So these were just some of the questions we asked and the results show in terms of motivation. I think it's not surprising that faith, my own religious teaching uh, dictate, and we had people bringing us verses. We had a workshop to uh, share the results and we had verses from the Quran, verses from the Bible, the New Testament supporting the importance of forgiveness. And actually, honestly, no one doubts that. No one says, oh, we're not a forgiving culture, religion, or whatever. But how do we really act on it? How do we behave? Is the disconnect that I always find between what people think and what they do. And that's by itself is an, its own research, uh, um, uh, empirical research-based question as well. And then people said, well, it's our human nature. We really want to let go because we don't want the headache and so forth. And there were those who said, well, we have to forgive because this is how we can live together as neighbors, as family, as people. And our traditions, our culture, our national duty, they all call us to, to forgive. And then, you know, sometimes we feel guilty if we don't forgive, especially when it's someone who's close to us. Hamad. In terms of the forgiveness uh, figures and symbols, I already shared that. It's very rare to find those. Someone said the historical uh, figures. But what we also found that a lot of people see in their elderly uh, figures for forgiveness and figures of um, uh, wisdom, people who can reconcile. And I think they were most likely thinking about reconciliation because the elderly do still pay, uh, play a role in bringing people together, finding arrangements, sulha, and, and other types of um, uh, rituals to, um, to reconcile. In terms of the obstacles we found, uh, Muhammad, on uh, forgiveness. Um, next one, Muhammad. Sometimes it gets stuck there. Okay, thank you. Um, intentionality, if someone harm me intentionally, I will never forgive. If someone harms someone close to me, I will never forgive. If someone betrayed me, which was very interesting, we haven't seen that in other samples in other places, but betrayal, cheating, lying, gossiping, treason, all of these were just people took it to their hearts, like I will not forgive. This will be one of the obstacles that will not allow me even to forgive if someone insults my religion, including blasphemy and cursing my own religion, and breaking any religious boundaries, atheism and so forth, we will not forgive among our sample, matters of honor, dignity, family honor, we will not, and personal community rights, including our national rights. This was very much a Palestinian thing. And one of the questions we always get, are you talking about forgiveness, reconciliation amongst us? Or are you going to Israel? Are we doing that with the Israeli Jews? Are we doing that with the government of Israel? And what we're saying, what I say is, no, we're actually calling about, talking about your own community, your own village, whether it's Ramallah, Al-Bire, Nasri, Mghar, or whatever, we have these interpersonal relations, family, clannish type of uh, alliances that dictate a lot of what we do. Still till today, uh, it, it, in, in some instances, dictates how we vote even. 
if there are voting and, and elections. So that's where this personal community rights, justice, my own national rights came from a lot of the Palestinians in the sample. And when someone repeats the action of harm, hurt, injury, and so forth, I will not forgive. So as you see, there are lots of obstacles to forgiveness, but doesn't mean there isn't a range within each, but we consistently found in the survey, as well as the interviews, that intentionality, if someone means to harm me, that there is less forgiveness, which is very consistent across the study and from all the countries where we collected data. So someone who is intentionally trying to hurt me, I will not forgive, I will not let go, I will not speak to him, her or her, and I will try to get my um, revenge in this, they're stuck in this cycle that uh, I like about what um, Professor Abu Nimr just shared, they're stuck in the revenge cycle. Moving more recently, um, and I don't wanna take a lot of the time, um, and I'm happy we actually published several articles based on this study that you could find on Google Scholar, whether you try Mohammed's name or mine. But this study is a larger study in Muslim societies, which I've been working on as a senior researcher at the International Institute of Islamic Thought. And here we focused on uh, Muslim communities, if it's in um, um, Jordan, Sudan, Kenya, Tanzania, Morocco, Algeria, and we had Muslim uh, Islamic schools in the US. About 13, 14 different countries participated in a bigger study on well being, socio emotional learning, and how we look at these and their importance in terms of the attitudes we have um, in these different countries. For the MENA region, we had uh, five countries that participated, Sudan, Jordan, Morocco, Algeria. The first study we had the Palestine, and we hope to add more from the Arab region as we move forward. As you see, our target groups were uh, students, school students in secondary education, their teachers, university students, and their faculty. So we um, collected data from mostly uh, India, as you see in the in the chart and then followed by Bosnia. In some of these countries, you would see that there were more representative sampling, like in Bosnia, it's small and they were able to survey from a lot of places. But in a place like India, it was very much limited to um, areas in New Delhi and around it, because of course, India is huge and Muslim, my, my, uh, my Muslim communities are very spread around. And as you see, our largest sample was in schools, less than 18. And we had a little bit more females than males, um, tendency in education to have more teachers in secondary education and more uh, males in higher ed, uh, as you probably would expect. There is a report to, if you go to our website, www.iiit.org, to show the results, I'm only highlighting two results that we had. One of them is uh, general means on the different scales. And just to give you an idea, all along in the both studies we conducted, 2018, 2019, 2019, 2020, when we collected data, our forgiveness uh, sample or our means on forgiveness were always the lowest. As you see here, it was 2.35 across all groups. We think that this doesn't mean that uh, Muslims don't forgive. No, it just seem, seems to me because our um, forgiveness measure includes scenarios that people have to respond to, I think, and I'm, I, we have to prove it statistically, but I think that there's this tendency and clarity of what's yes and what's no, versus when you're asked to agree with like empathy item, I am easy, I can put myself in someone else's shoes, agree, disagree, of course they'll agree. But in, on the forgiveness one, there were harder, um, I think people had a harder time agreeing and with some of the scenarios we introduced, like the ones we just mentioned to you as examples. We included a lot of others like religiosity and problem solving for students, meaning making. Some of them are values 
important in Islam and for Islamic, for Muslim communities, but also that they are across very important. And we want to argue that actually we can teach those in, in schools at the higher level, um, higher education level as well. And just to give you an idea, uh, you would think that, oh, of course, people will agree and they'll score high means on all of these lovely, good human being type of uh, values and competencies. But here is just one slide, Muhammad, the last one, to show you despite social desirability that we all have as a limitation in quantitative research, but despite that, look at the differences between the different countries. I mean, if you look at it closely and if we had more time, I would say, okay, there is variation on the forgiveness. Look at, for example, places like India and um, consistently Tatarstan, which is a Muslim region in Russia, consistently across all, they were lowest, including religiosity and spirituality. They're like around the two, while everyone else is close to four. The scale was from one to four. And you would see there that, and when we asked our team in um, Tatarstan what's going on, they said, oh, this is probably leftovers from the Soviet Union. We have to study it more. But consistently, Tatarstan is lower on a lot of the uh, values we and skills, competencies that we research. But what, what we're concerned with today here is the forgiveness one. And you see that there are some variations. We have places like Tanzania that scored almost three on, on the scenarios. But we also have places like Bosnia, India, and Mauritius where there is a large, about 30% or 40 uh, Muslims in uh, Mauritius, I think, Muhammad, is that correct? Yes. yes. Or the, yeah, so there are about 40% Muslims that actually uh, scored lower on, on forgiveness. So there's a lot that we want to learn. And one of the studies that we, analysis we're conducting right now is to look at a group of critical thinking skills, like problem solving. Is it related to forgiveness? If we teach someone to problem solve in this critical thinking curricula that we have on secondary education and a higher ed, if we teach that, can we also increase problem solving skills? Can we also increase forgiveness education? And I wanna say the last thing here is that um, Hamad and myself, we put actually a forgiveness curriculum together that has been used in the Arab world in different schools mostly. And we trained a group of people to implement it. But we, of course, we still need to look at uh, other data and to do empirical research to see whether they made a difference or not. If any of you is interested in the data set we have, it's publicly available on the website, our website. We are actually offering two mini grants this summer for people who are interested in playing with this data. Um, and there is that announcement on Triple IT website, iiit.org, and other data sources. You would see that also on the website. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ilham. So you received from Ilham a two sets of data. The first one we done several years ago, but this one, last one, we still doing this, or she's still doing this this week. And the link to forgiveness and other competencies is still something that we are very interested in, and hopefully we'll produce something about it later on. Uh, answering the question, if you are high on forgiveness, does that mean you have high on empathy, high on problem solving, high on self-efficacy, high on spirituality. Is there, a, is there a correlation between the willingness to forgive versus other skills that you must have? And that's a very important question for us to explore later on in the research as well. But uh, Ilham invited you to look at the data, raw data. I mean, you can do your PhD analysis on the, the data, the data is about 20 or about 18,000 people, 18,000 surveys. So it's a huge mega data. that 40,000 in two studies. Oh, okay. 40,000 so people. In the two together, it's 40,000 people survey and the data is public, open. People can use it to write about it and analyze it. 
Uh, and we have five more minutes, correct? So in the five more last minutes, what I'd like to do is to just, you know, we've shared with you two segments. In the last one, we always ask in the, recon in the reconciliation workshop, training, discussion, and lectures, why, why if Islam calls for reconciliation, forgiveness, and people are high on the willingness to forgive and reconcile, what prevent people from being reconciliation? One, you know, and we've, we've collected many obstacles, but one of them is the absence of physical security. It's very difficult for a person to forgive and for reconcile if he or she feels threatened for their survival. And it, it will become more difficult. And many of the Arab countries live in places right now with high insecurity level. Collapse of dysfunctional basic infrastructure. Again, survival mode. How can you engage in forgiveness and reconciliation when the infrastructure, and this is economic, security, uh, court, um, education, basic physical movement, is dysfunctional. There is no infrastructure for it. How could you entertain these issues as well? And this is this is consistent with Burton, John Burton theory of basic human needs. And also in psychology, well, people argue you need to have the basic human needs secure before you move into other uh, basic human needs, before you move into other uh, um, other values as well. There is a law degree of a trust in central governance system. The governance system is very low. People don't trust the government. People don't trust the, the, the authority. Therefore, the whole issue of calling for reconciliation collectively in the Arab region becomes very uh, difficult. Look at Tunisia, look at Libya, look at Egypt, look at Lebanon. Very little trust in the government and in politicians to follow them collectively for reconciliation. Uh, and um, as you all know, I don't need to tell you that, institutions serving divided identity lines. Uh, the society is divided, fully divided according to identity lines. And yeah, Sunni, Shia, North, South, men, women, uh, tribal divisions, uh, you name it. This, this, I, this war of identities in many ways infiltrated the institutions and this is, makes it far more difficult to build any trust in the system. Us versus them, and many times uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, dehumanizing the others as well. And there are several, several other reasons. I don't wanna, um, you know, again, the, the narrative as well, uh, disenfranchised, segregated, competing efforts, the globalization trends, all of these factors were mentioned by people when we asked them why you don't deal with the reconciliation. I want to finish with the Arab women leading reconciliation. There are some good examples, and we both chose the example of women in Tunisia, women in Libya, uh, women in general engaging in voices and attempt for reconciliation. And we found this to be to be more promising in number of Arab countries as examples. To, to put the reconciliation topic on the table, some Arab women are speaking about the need that we need, the only way to break out of the cycle of violence is to have women being empowered and being uh, 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 leading the voices for reconciliation in that context. And there are some examples that we uh, have had. There are some, you know, some more practical suggestion what to do and how to do that. I'm happy to talk about it later on. But thank you. I think we took about an hour. Uh, yes, 58 minutes for this presentation. Uh, the floor is yours back, uh, Iyad. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Hamad Abunir and Professor Inham for this very exciting and enlightenment about reconciliation and forgiveness. We really appreciate you very much for ha and having you. We also would like to welcome Professor Martin Liner as well. He is also with us. Hello, Professor. And uh, he was open for the discussion as well. Maybe you'd like to say some words, Professor. 
Yeah, hello, Mohamed uh, Ilham. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm glad to see you. Good to see you again, Mark. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, and uh, we would like now to open for discussion, but we'd like to take some break because we have our professors who talk for like one hour and a half now. So maybe they would like to have some coffee or something. I, I have I have a 10 o'clock, which is in half an hour, so I prefer we continue, if it's okay. We can continue, and then maybe after half an hour, we can take our coffee break, if you like. Thank okay, you. Whatever. So we can have more of uh, Dr. Muhammad. And maybe Professor Muhammad as well, he can stay with us longer. Yes, yes, you? I'm happy to stay with you afterwards. She has a meeting, as she told us. We, we will uh, arrange it that uh, the, the coffee break will be 10 minutes after uh, half an hour of this uh, time. So I'll open, open it to discussion and I would like uh, to start with actually with Professor Muhammad Abu Nimr. Would he ask a question that came up? Why like in the Arab world, we, our religion, whether Christian or Muslim, mostly uh, promote uh, reconciliation and, the, and forgiveness in our societies and everything. But, Usually we are not having reconciliation, that it's not there. And when people who are working on reconciliation sometimes get messed up with normalization. And some comments that I got from my last article that I am not doing normalization. So what is the difference between reconciliation and normalization? I think this we should discuss as well, and forgiveness. And what the relations of reconciliation and forgiveness can promote is reconciliation and interdependent of forgiveness, or is forgiveness another topic of reconciliation, or if forgiveness is a pillar on reconciliation, uh, what's the relations, what's the real relation? Are they interdependent of each other? Or they are dependent from each other? I can forgive, but never reconcile, for example. Or maybe if I want to really go to re towards reconciliation, can I get to forgiveness first and then go to reconciliation? So maybe I give the floor for everyone for these kind of questions, and. Let's see what we can get out of this debate. I see Professor Liner has his hand. Welcome, Professor. Of course, we would like to start with you, Professor, if you have, uh, how do you would like to answer us. Your mic. You, you're muted. Your mic is muted. Is it good now? Yeah. All right, thank you. Great. So my apologies that I'm late. Maybe you said it before, um, did you ask the people what they understand exactly by forgiveness? Because um, people, in my experience, can mean by forgiveness just, uh, I do not want revenge anymore, but I uh, don't trust the other and don't want to have to deal with the other person. They can mean uh, really uh, the mistake is, uh, not anymore punished, it's over, there's no mistake, uh, mayor. it's uh, like uh, uh, amnesty, or they can even mean uh, that we are friends again, and that we want to trust and to build something together. So there is a whole scale of understanding sometimes people have of uh, forgiveness, and um, they have maybe also their concept, what should be part of forgiveness, uh, is it needed, for example, some have a script in their mind and say, I can forgive if the other apologizes. Or, and if not, why should I forgive, for example? Or other have this idea of an absolute forgiveness that I forgive even if the other does not ask. And, um, and all these ideas of the people who, uh, what they have, I would like to know a bit more what you, you found in your very, very impressive research. It's really great, all these people you ask and you found out so interesting things. So this is, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. And uh, I saw that Bashar Rahim uh, raised his hand. So Bashar, you have the mic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ilham and Dr. Muhammad. I have a question. It's related to uh, Dr. Martin's and uh, Dr. Iyad question. That could I say that forgiveness equals healing? It means when I forgive, it means uh, it's it's a re recovering the emotional self and uh, collective memory for the, the different groups. And could I say that? Reconcilia reconciliation without forgiveness, which 
is, is that mean that we are still revolving in the revenge cycle, but in a passive and unconscious, in unconscious way? Thank you. Thank you very much. I also would like to add a question actually about the background that I saw before and that the results that you did in your session. There is something called what we study actually in, in Oxford called reference class forecasting. So you studied the empathy. And then did you do a reverse study? People who do not want empathy and why and where and what happened. So you have like if you and I see that you did like you asked on what average was you have empathy which is between three and four, and then to what? What is the probab uh, probability or probability that you did? So like 2.5 to what? To the population of the country? For that, I see US is like uh, at the last, at the end. So it's, I think for the number of population, so maybe that was it. So compared to the population of each country, 2.5% want empathy. And then if you do like what we call reference class forecasting, you'll discover that that means 98% of the Americans don't want empathy. This is or 98% of your whole, uh, what you call it, your whole, uh, uh, you know, study of the people, the 100% that you studied on, do not want empathy. And that would give you another reference class that those segments that you worked on, only 2.3, percent want empathy. What are the reasons that the 89% of each country and you go that do not want empathy? And I think this is like a huge study and what can affect to develop because what we do here in Vienna is conflict transformation. So the reference class forecasting can understand how conflict transformation happened between two both. People who have transformed into empathy and you saw that it's going empathy 2.5 and what will happen when you transfer the other people and why and when. This is part of why uh, I would like to, if you did this actually or something, in the, and actually in Oxford they do that, they study that before doing the project. So I say that you have 20, 21, 23, you know, do you understand why people do not want empathy? So this is also like a, and maybe if there was the other, other, other lecture, uh, other studies, research, that studied why people do not want empathy or why your group do not want empathy. So this is my question to you is actually about my, my comment about what I saw in the, in the study that you did. Yeah, thank you so much, actually. We have also uh, Rowan who would like to ask a question. Yeah, thank you. So thank you, uh, Dr. Ilham and, yeah, and Professor Muhammad. Um, last week, we were introduced to the idea that forgiveness is also only offered if asked for. How does that relate to your um, like approach to forgiveness? Does that contradict with your approach to forgiveness or does it also um, like work side by side with it? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? That we, we can start the discussion. If no more yeah, questions. I have one question for Dr. Ilham. Uh, the research you conducted in Lebanon. So, what I could see the survey, it's a uh, 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 it's about, uh, I mean, contained only the uh, grassroots, but where are the political elites in these surveys? And uh, is it not necessary to know uh, uh, about the, their understandings or about reconciliation, forgiveness? Because, you know, as uh, uh, in Lebanon, the political elites direct the country in their, uh, for, for their own interest and they mobilize the people. So, is it necessary to know ab about their uh, in the, in the understandings? And, uh, more questions to the table, or maybe professors would like to answer some of the questions, and then the debate will open more and more into the other you know, people to go in. Yeah, we can maybe take uh, some Ilham. May, do, do you mind taking? Uh, there is the issue of the sample in Lebanon, yeah. and also another one for you might want to talk the about reverse the, study. The, the reverse, reverse study, yeah. the empathy yeah. uh, component that uh, yeah. Iyad mentioned. Go ahead. Well, let me talk about the political elites and uh, their views and attitudes on um, on um, forgiveness, for example. In, in our study, we went with teachers 
and uh, educators mostly because we wanted to see what's happening in schools because we also assume that schools are a place where it's safe to conduct research, it's safe for people, relatively safe for people to talk to us, but also there is a chance to insert, embed some of the concepts we're working with in schools. With the political elites, um, you could definitely, we need to know where they stand on these issues, but it's an area where I feel like, honestly, in the MENA region, it's kind of waste for me because um, whatever they answer and, and, and the political scientists, international relations might have a different uh, answer here, but in order to influence the political elites, we go into the areas where we can have a difference. And I feel like we, from my work, where we can have a difference is in schools, educators and families and communities. And hopefully this will, the grassroots will push for, for change. Um, whether Abu Mazin believes in forgiveness or not, doesn't really matter because he's not gonna make decisions based on his tendencies. But this is the educator in me and the frustrated Arab who's saying that, not necessarily the researcher, but definitely it's a good study to hear more about what do really the political elites think about and their attitudes towards something similar to what we did with teachers. Absolutely, it's a great idea. In terms of the reverse, well, um, you know, what do people think about no empathy? <laughs> it's interesting. Um, one of the, of course, the limitations of our study is that it was cross-sectional, quantitative, uh, we went where we had access. It wasn't a representative sample of the communities. Maybe in Bosnia, we were able to reach that uh, type of proportional sampling that you talked about, Iyad. But I am very interested in the, the you know, okay, so what are the rest of the people think on no empathy? <laughs> do they, what do they think about that? And um, as you realize in such a large study, we translated the surveys into 12 languages and we had to ensure the validity of the translation uh, through back translations and other methods. But to get people to answer the reverse questions was very, very hard and problematic to translate. That doesn't mean we cannot conduct a study um, to ask the opposite to us. And I think that's what you're trying to say. What, what do the rest of the people who are not the two and a half percent say about empathy or forgiveness or other, it's definitely a very valid study to have. Usually it's the funding, it's the, we are fund, self-funded in this research and this study. So it, um, it makes it really very limited in the terms of the scope that we can reach, but we hope that we can do more. What's interesting is that when I talk about this study, in particular, the study uh, among uh, Muslim communities and countries. When I talk about it, I talk about the message that is acid-based and not deficit-based, meaning that we want to identify and maybe share with the academic communities that young people in the Muslim world are also believers in empathy and hope. We have a perceived hope measure in our study, and they, they score high on that. Youth in the Muslim world are not necessarily looked at as examples of terrorism or whatever in the your areas of uh, preventing uh, extremism and all of that. I come to it to show that there is some base to say there's a lot of strength among the new generation in the Muslim world. And that's one of our messages in the study. So I, I try to convey this when I talk about this study in particular. And someone told me uh, as a response and a question was like, so what that you found out that most youth in the Muslim world are empathetic? What does that mean? So if that's the case, then what's, what's the problem with the rest of the Muslim world and Muslim countries and Arab countries where nothing is working, everything is hopeless and, and so forth. This is just a sample, a cut, cross-sectional cut of a huge, data set, a huge participant pool that we reach, but it's not the whole story, of course. And I think there's a lot that could be done to learn more about this. 
Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ilham. Just uh, uh, add also further, and Ilham, maybe you want to also shed light on this, that this is a three, you know, and the forgiveness, it's 2.35 the means, uh, and 3.6 the means on a scale of one to four, which means, you know, the, the high, it's a relatively high score in, uh, on, the, on the empathy, 3.16. And in self-regulation, 3.2022, the last one. So th these are fairly high scores uh, on the scale of one to four uh, that, that people responded. It's not necessarily a percentage. But interestingly enough, we have 2.3 uh, on forgiveness, which is uh, a little bit above, uh, above the middle, uh, you know, 3.35 uh, above the middle. But uh, re regardless, I think, I think, I think Muhammad, the question was about the proportional sample size, if I understood it. He was asking if you got to, if your 11% of your sample came from Bosnia, and maybe it's like 2% of the Bosnia, oh, okay. what oh, happens yeah. to the 98% yeah. that yeah. not ask about this? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank Very you. interesting <laughs> orientation. Thank you. Um, so those were in the link between reconciliation and forgiveness, I think, was also asked by uh, Bashar, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and also, uh, Iyad, Dr. Iyad put it uh, earlier on. As I said initially, there is a problematic link between them in the literature, both in the literature of forgiveness and in the literature of reconciliation. The link between reconciliation and forgiveness, in my view, so far is not settled yet. And really that has to do with the orientation, the theory, where the researcher and the scholar come from. So what I put on the table is one way to look at it. I come from the school or I support the notion that to forgive is necessary condition to reach a holistic, comprehensive, genuine, lasting sense, transformational sense of reconciliation. If you are not for engaged in forgiveness process, then your process of reconciliation, in my view, is, is less complete. And I come from this, again, because I'm doing more of a religious studies as well. Theologically speaking, you know, for forgiveness from a Muslim perspective, from a Christian, from a Jewish, from many theological places, it's a higher level of engagement with other people. And I am saying this because forgiveness carries the meaning of what Martin mentioned. Uh, uh, you know, what do, what do we mean by forgiveness? What, mean, what we define forgiveness here is it, uh, you could be uh, unilateral. I forgive you and I don't want anything from you, regardless the motivation. And I'm willing to continue and work with you and live with you peacefully. And there is the mutual forgiveness. We both forgive each other and we have terms and condition how we're going to deal with each other. So that's one way to define forgiveness as a transformational, as holistic approach. That's one school. There's another school that says, no, forgiveness is a religious thing. It's theological thing. It's individual decision. We should be focusing on the reconciliation as agreement, political agreement, that has conditions for how do we live together. And it doesn't require us to clean our heart. It doesn't require us to psychologically process the injury, the hurt, the victimhood that we have had. And that's what Bashar mentioned, passive. That's the, in my view, that's a passive way of reconciliation. It's a passive because it's temporary. It's only a temporary, partial, it's not comprehensive, it's not holistic in its way. 
uh, it's a kind of, you know, let's, it's what you have right now in South Africa. We have arrangement in South Africa that white and black can vote equally and the governance is shared, but we continue to live black and white separate and we continue to have so many prejudice and discrimination and negative view of other. It's the same thing what we have right now in Northern Ireland, where you have Catholic and Protestant have agreed on some ways of living together, but not necessarily, not necessarily um, uh, cleaning, cleansing, visiting the victimhood. Their commission on victimhood in Northern Ireland failed. They could not deal with the commission on victimhood and dealing with the past. And it's the same thing what we have also in Bosnia. In Bosnia, since 1996, we have had four or five elections already, but we repeat the same election. It's the same thing what we have in Taif, Lebanon, since 1991. Again, we have many of those so-called reconciliation agreements, but those reconciliation agreements are passive agreements of coexistence of living peacefully together. And they lack, in my view, the comprehensive holistic approach to humanist values of forgiveness in order to forgive each other. So for me, forgiveness is really, in many ways, a stage beyond the reconciliation. And I, I'm, I must admit, this is one school, one approach. There is another approach that also defines reconciliation in holistic way, but it doesn't require forgiveness, because they associate forgiveness with religion, which I think is a mistake. Forgiveness is not religious. Forgiveness is a human sense, a human a part of a human interaction, and you don't have to be religious in order to forgive people. You can have your own set of values and, and norms. Um, I'm not sure forgiveness is only if you ask for. No, I think this is what... Um, um, forget your first name, but I know it's Tahboub, the last name, Rowan. <laughs> That's what Rowan says. I'm not sure what context was in the uh, previous lecture, but forgiveness happen whether you ask for it or you don't ask for it. Uh, I have a, I have an example. It's a, also well known in Rwanda, in Burundi, Rwanda um, where a, a general in the army um, opened the prison, uh, one of the prisons, and let go of many Hutus who committed, were participated in the genocide. And there were about 150 of them in his own town, in his own place. And he opened and he says, as Martin described, amnesty. I don't need any from you. We all as a community don't need anything from you. And he let them go. I have worked in Sierra Leone with the traditional leaders, tribal leaders who will around the fire, it's called Fumble Talk. It's a project that's been running for uh, 12 years now. And it's adopted by the Sierra Leone government where people in small villages around the fire after a year, a year and a half of work with them as community, they do this ritual and therefore, and the one perpetrator stands up and he or she speaks about what they have done during the civil war in Sierra Leone. And he basically says, whether you forgive me or not, it's your decision, but I don't expect it from you if you, uh, if you don't wanna give it. And community, people in the community, some of them decide to forgive, others do not. Majority of them decide to forgive in order to resume their life. But the key to understand forgiveness, I think, and reconciliation is to look at it as a, an individual decision. It's not your mother, your father, your community, your priest. This cannot happen. I listen to the imam in my village and I listen to the imam every week calling for reconciliation and forgiveness. And I said, yeah, okay, this is, this is a khutbah. This is Yom Jum'ah, Friday sermon. It's okay, he has to say this. In my heart, I would never allow this to go in. 
I have shielded myself from the decision to forgive those who destroyed my house, injured my family, killed member of my family. No one in the world will convince me to forgive unless I do it. So this whole conceptualization of collective forgiveness, collective reconciliation, in my view, is very limited if we don't take into consideration the individual set of values, individual processes. And maybe I give you a, an exercise. I know your program does not do that much in the lecture. So here's an exercise for you in the coffee break. And you could see when we come back the results if you want to engage Bashar was in some of them. <laughs> anyway, in your coffee break, think of this situation. Okay? And I'm not trying to stir conflicts among you. Just an a, a illustration, just an illustration. If somebody who study with you went to Martin and Iyad and they spoke badly about you, spoke badly about you on three occasions. And then Martin and Iyad had a meeting and says, um, you know, we are really sorry, but you were not sure you're a good fit for this program. And they sent you the note, thank you, and you're no longer with us. Will you forgive them? <laughs> they not already decided no. <laughs> so this is one of the 10 scenarios we gave to people. Will you forgive? Is I think it this scenario is it, or is it fixed? What? Can we play a little bit with the scenario or is it yes, fixed? Yes, yes, yes. No, after the co coffee, you can play with it as you want. Take your coffee <laughs> and think about this and then you come back and it's no longer in theory. That's the 10 cases we gave people. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the Imam, what Martin, what Iyad, what the priest, whoever tell you that, it's your own decision. And let's come back and hear from you if yes or no. And what are the condition that yes or no? I think Ilham, Ilham dropped, right? Yes, she said she had the meeting, I'm sorry. Uh, um, I have a comment or remark. Uh, I'm against to name what happened in Middle East uh, for reconciliation as a reconciliation. For example, Ta'if ta is a reconciliation. Al-Ula between Qatar and uh, Saudi Arabia is a reconciliation, but effectively it lacks the most mechanisms of reconciliation. So what we don't name this reconciliation as political settlements or uh, uh, political agreements. So why we, we, we call them reconciliation? So in this way, we uh, misguide the people or the researcher or uh, whatever is uh, interested in reconciliation because it's really different from what we learn now. Uh, absolutely, and uh, thank you for making, uh, making this note. I mean, I, I mentioned earlier that I'll show it because I think you're pointing it out and I mentioned it very clearly here that one of the six here, you are talking about nature of the transitional agreement or contract. That agreement, whether it is a Ula or it is a Ta'if or it is Dayton or Oslo or Good Friday agreement, these are political agreements they use the language of reconciliation, but within them, there are no components and mechanisms to ensure reconciliation. In my view, even on the contrary, Oslo was an agreement that will never get to a reconciliation. It was an agreement for passive coexistence, even with some form of uh, domination. The key here is how much a trust is between those parties when they are negotiating. And this is not only political agreement, uh, Zainat. Think of a husband and wife. Think of two families. 
that they have a conflict between them and they reach a sulha. And the sulha is that you will have to um, pay us 50,000 dinar for the one person that you killed from our family. After you pay the 50,000 dinar, and before that you were expelled for three months outside of the village, and then the terms that you come back and live in the village, you pay the 50,000 dinar, and that's it. There is no other interaction between us. That's a partial agreement. It doesn't sustain the peace. It says, for now, we're OK. And we even appoint a judge in case of future problem, and we can go to that judge. But I will continue to tell my family, you should not trust that one. You should hate them. This is what they've done for us. And that's where the key for this dynamic of reconciliation lies. Uh, the, the Lebanese, sorry, just I last sentence. That. Last sentence. That the, the Lebanese government did not, the Lebanese after Ta'if did not agree on history book until now. The way they teach history is a problematic. So there are mechanisms in the society that continue to perpetuate this cycle. Sorry, go ahead. So, uh, in this way, we can say that these political agreements and the, the uh, 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 like, like uh, let me say, uh, uh, plastic surgery of the conflict to, to move uh, to stabilization is a challenge and is the main obstacle to reach the reconciliation in such countries. And I have another concern about uh, or question about forgiveness. Uh, why we don't relate the forgiveness to the state building? For example, in a country such as Lebanon, you know, it uh, constituted, uh, constituted on competitiveness between the sects. So uh, the lack of trust, uh, the uh, 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 competition of the authority. So since the inception of Lebanon, for example, so the hateness and the lack of trust and uh, uh, we can say uh, 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 the existential threat uh, 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 grew with the state building. So what's the relation between forgiveness and state building in Middle East, let us say? Yeah, um, you are a political science international relation and everybody we know, we teach that also at American University that uh, state affairs and politics are done based on interest and real politic and power relations. Um, and when diplomats and negotiators sit, they talk about interest, economic, political interests, and so forth. The concept of peace building, conflict transformation, forgiveness, reconciliation are different processes. Their, the assumption is not about real politique. Their assumptions are different. And this is, this is the debate between peace and, and political science, peace building and political science. Peace building has different assumptions than the political science in terms of power relations. Um, and that's always have been the debate. It's the debate between, <laughs> between you know, uh, again, those who think of the what we call them the realists, and the idealist. Realists are the one who control politics and the idealists are the one who basically preaching like us in this program and many other program, preaching for peace, collaboration, a human rights, a humanist relation, collaboration, cooperation, problem solving. Uh, and the realist called for uh, interest-based negotiation, called for power relation, called for competition, and basically uh, assign more responsibility to state rather than to people. That's, that's, where, you know, that's where the debate is. Uh, I don't think, again, whether Lebanon or any other part of the Arab world or even the US right now, um, we also caught in the same principle of tribalism. These are all tribal identities. Tribal, not in the sense of tribal Bedouin, tribal in the sense of each one belong to a group, whether it is black, white, orange, and your group is your loyalty to the group and not necessarily to the system or to the, to the state or to the 
to the common entity that uh, organize the public relations. Um, and that a tribal mentality is or sectarian is very deep in Lebanon. And if you look at it, the Lebanese cultural system, the Lebanese uh, governance system, the Lebanese social system, the Lebanese residential, the way the buildings are organized, the way the streets are organized, it's all organized in one purpose, to maintain sectarian segregation. And this has been for over two centuries, at least two centuries. So, uh, and that's part, that's a, maybe a lecture for, a topic for different lecture, which is how does sectarian identity perpetuated in society? And I think the boundaries and the walls in Lebanon are very, very, very clear and they come, uh, you know, they come to the surface with every problem. Without dealing with the root causes, it's very hard to transform such society. It's the same thing in the US. We don't deal with race relation, black and white. And that's why we're caught into this even after 350 years of slavery. Now, suddenly in the last, not suddenly, in the past four or five years, Black Lives Matter is on the surface because we did not deal with the principle that organized the American society. White is better than Black. White is superior to Black. And that principle is the way the American society has been organized since its inception. And it built many institutions around that principle. Sunni are superior to Shia. Is the same exact principle that Muslim society adopted for the past six, 1500 years. And we organize our talks, theory, children, education, political institution, military. We, edu we organize the entire society around that principle. We don't say it publicly. We don't admit it. The same principle also that Muslims are dominant over Christians. The Christians are partners, but the society public sphere is dominated by Muslim culture. And that principle exists and we organized it. We teach children, we do, do music, we do everything around this principle. And at the end, when the state collapse, the tribes attack each other and we go back each one to our tribe. Syria is a beautiful example of that. Beautiful, I'm sorry for the term beautiful ironic and also sad for, for this aspect. Iraq is very a clear example of this. Yemen is very clear. And if you want the classic one, look at Libya, where everybody went back to their tribal identity and the home. And that principle surface now in the politics. In every country in the Arab region right now, the negotiation is among politicians in how to carve a good peace for their tribe. And uh, many of us agree with that and obey it and uh, accept it implicitly and explicitly. In such context, our work is, is, is pioneer. In such context, your voice, Zenat, about reconciliation in a genuine way is very pioneer because you are challenging the core principle of a tribalism. You're saying, let's transcend our loyalty to tribe, to region, to different place, and let's have our loyalty to each other as a human equal. But you really need to, to believe in your heart, Zenat, that all Lebanese, regardless the color of their scarf, and regardless if they have a scarf on their head or not, are truly equal. And you have to believe that from a faith. In your interpretation of Islam, Christian and Muslims in Lebanon 
are equal in faith and in humanity. And you have to fight in the school, in the radio, in the university to carve that space of equality. That's what I, that's what my heart tell me. And that's what I learned in many places. I'm sorry to be, uh, today is a Friday. So it's almost a Friday preaching. So I gave you the last preaching for today. We still have uh, some questions, by the way, in this chat. But if you like, we can take five minute break to drink something, maybe or go to the, you know, to the toilets or anything, if you like. Uh, like five minute breaks, is that okay for everyone? I'm, I'm so, okay with you. I'm, I'm with you until 10.30, definitely. No problem. I don't know if you got introduced to Laura as well. Dr. Laura is our practice, Amina practice director. I don't know if she can hear me. She's, a, yes, she's also... Uh, yes. Well, yes, she, uh, yes. Uh, Four o'clock in the morning and uh, she's still uh, struggling. No, 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 it's just, your voice was cutting out. No, but we, were, we had a chance just to chat very quickly before we started. And uh, because we had actually been at George Mason also. So it was really good to meet you again, but it was really good to hear um, both of you. I, I'm just, I hope that we'll be able to hear from Dr. Nasar again. And just a really quick comment and I'll be very brief. Something that struck me from uh, your presentations, both your presentations was that you said, that the question about critical thinking and problem solving, and is there a link? And is that, and I have to say that I've been doing work um, with interpersonal and interpersonal, but interpersonal now, speaking about interpersonal, about the person, um, in terms of reconciliation with the self, Israelis, Palestinians, Japanese, etc. And I have found that there is this point that each, it doesn't matter if you're an Israeli, Palestinian, or a Japanese, once you have the critical thinking and you have the problem solving as part of your toolkit, that opens up another space for that process of, of, of forgiveness with the self. And then you have more space for that next step if you are going to decide to take it, but you need, you need to have those, those tools, or at least a, a balance of tools with you in order to be able to have space enough for you to take the next step. So I thought that was very interesting. And of course, I'm going to be reading more of your research. Thank you so much, Dr. Abunima. Thank you, thank you. I mean, absolutely. Um, we found out that we know that critical thinking and problem solving are essential for peace building and for diversity. But to make the step toward reconciliation and forgiveness, they're not sufficient. They're essential, but they're not sufficient. That's why we added empathy. And we're trying mm -hmm. to think whether empathy is also, if you put it with those two skills, mm -hmm. Will be will be will raise the possibility for uh, for forgiveness and reconciliation, and that's the type of analysis we hopefully will do in the next phase. But yes, critical thinking is important. Problem solving is essential. But I know I, in my work in the past thirty years or so, I have seen so many enlightened liberal who have a blind spots when it comes to homosexuality, when it, comes, when it comes to a gender, when it comes to, you know, I find many American Jewish ex very, very, very liberal on everything. And then when it comes to issue of Israel, Palestine, they are very conservative. They're very, they're very afraid, fearful. I found many Arabs who are so, so liberal on the issue of uh, Palestine, on the issue of gender, on the issue of many things. But when it comes to race, I found with them a blind spot. They still think that the, the color of the skin is more important. But I absolutely agree with you. These are foundational skills and they open a space for further engagement. And I just need to make one more comment, Dr. Abunima. It's because for us, for 15 years, we, we worked the, the part of the healing of um, the transformation of, of the self, of the heart, of the mind, the spirit, and we work all this, but we also have this part of critical thinking and problem solving. But for 15 years, we, we, we don't know if it's just the fact that the, that transformative part that we do with the healing is what's having the effect, or if it's also the other skills. We think it's also the other skills, but we've never had a study that allows yeah. us to start to, to think about the fact that Maybe just 15 years, we were not wrong in the sense of what we were looking at, but we had nothing to actually compare it to. 
because we were just doing it on our own and um, quietly. Uh, so it's, I'm very much looking to share my, uh, your research with also my colleagues, because we've asked ourselves this question, is this what's also boosting it? All the healing work, is this boosting it or is it just an addition? But I, I think by what I'm understanding, there's really a correlation there. So I'm very, I'm looking forward to sharing your research as well. Weak coloration, co co weak coloration, but we still, you know, we're still exploring that. In the, in the chat, there was a question about um, an educator. Do you think that forgiveness lesson can be taught for the diverse age? Yes, absolutely. And we, we did the research on elementary and middle school as well. Um, and also uh, for teachers, by the way, our, our research was mainly for teachers. Um, but then we did the research in Jordan for teachers who taught in the schools, meaning we gave them the curriculum and they went and taught it. And then we, uh, we examined the students, the effect on the students. And we find significant effect among the students who went through three months of those curriculum uh, as well. But we did not do yet um, surveys on the elementary school or middle school. It's very hard to do that because of the mechanics and also funding in many ways we could not uh, had that. Did you find differences between men and women teachers in the con? And that's a very important question. Until now in the two research, we did not find any gender differences significant. Although the stereotype is that women are more forgiving. Women are more reconciling. But until now we did not find a, a significant difference between women and men in their willingness to forgive uh, based on these 10 cases. Thank you very much. Uh, we will continue, we just will give you five minutes uh, break. So we give Professor uh, Muhammad uh, something. And, and uh, please think about the example I gave you because I'm gonna come back and ask you one question. Will you forgive that person? I'm a very hard person to forgive. Thank you. We'll come back. We'll come back in five minutes. Five minutes.
Are you back? Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you doing? Very good. Actually, I'm interested in the subject. Excellent. Where are you from? From Qatar. Ahlan wa sahlan fi Qatar. Ahlan wa sahlan fi. And in Tijalis bi Doha al-an. La, wallah, fa Britannia. Ah, Qatar. Fa Britannia and the course Lugha. Ah. I'll try to tower myself in Lugha a little bit. When, but when the course is held? Ah, the Cambridge School. Cambridge. What Cambridge? Cambridge. Oh, Cambridge. في لندن. آه آه. في العاصمة. في العاصمة ممتاز ممتاز. إيه نعم. يعطيك العافية وإن شاء الله بالتوفيق. أنا شايف إنه مواعيدكم أنتوا عن جد مواعيد عربية على على مهلكم ماشينون. آه. العينة ما تتعمم على المجتمع. عينة عشوائية مش مضبوطة. يعني ألمانيا ألمانيا مش فارقة معكم. قلنا خمس دقائق نبدأ على الثمانية. <تصفيق> بس ما شاء الله مجهود جبار يعني البحث يبين يعني خذ جهد كبير تحضيره وترتيبه وتحديده ويعني جهد عظيم يعني يا طبعا طبعا سنوات ومن, ومن المواضيع والله يعني انا من الناس اللي يعني مهتم فيها جدا يعني حتى مهتم انه شلون ممكن الايات والسياق او النصوص الدينيه شلون ممكن تاثر على فكر المجتمع وعلى حسب القراءات يعني تعتمد على حسب او تعتمد على حسب يعني ايمان الشخص نفسه في بعض الناس يعني بعيدين شوي عن الدين يهمهم هذا الشيء نعم وما شاء الله التحاليل يعني اوضحت اشياء وتفاصيل يمكن حتى الواحد ما كان متوقعها يعني نعم نعم اي ما شاء الله اي ثينك انه انت في يعني احد الاشياء اللي انا كنت معني فيها وتكلمت فيها بعض الاحيان هو على يعني الان قطر والسعوديه رجعوا حبايب صحيح فالسؤال بعد اربع س... كان اربع سنوات امتدت المقاطعه تقريبا نعم يا فالسؤال انه يعني هل هناك بالفعل مصالحه او هل هناك حاجه للمصالحه او الى اي مدى الاربع سنوات تركوا اثر بشكل انه هناك حاجه الواحد يتكلم على المصالحه والمسامحه، هذا موضوع اللي ما ما هو مطروح ابدا في العلاقات بين الدولتين. الحقيقه هذا سؤال البحث مالي للدراسه. اه. This is my PhD main question. Excellent. And uh, but what I will do that I will uh, try to to depend on the digital dialogue that had been taken a place between uh, societies. And uh, I, I wish that I can achieve something. And maybe if I had had it great, I, I can answer the question after four, maybe four years or five years <laughs> from now. <laughs> inshallah, inshallah. Good luck. Inshallah. I didn't know that you're planning to work on that. So good luck. Actually, this is my proposal. Excellent. I didn't know that. Excellent. Yeah. Good. <laughs> so, Dr. Iyad, uh, I have a meeting uh, I have to attend in about 20 minutes. I need 10 minutes to prepare for it. So can we, or you don't need me. I, I just can say, I just want to hear the responses to my question. Yeah, we, we want you always, Professor. You are, you are one of our pillars of Armina. All right, so maybe, you know, I, you tell me about time-wise. Okay. I just had also a question, actually, that I, I prepared after the break. I would like to ask you about uh, practices of social reconciliation. So how forgiveness can, can relate to practices of social reconciliation? Because social reconciliation is something and social healing. So you said that it started with individuals. So how can you implement forgiveness when we are working on social reconciliation practice or social healing as part of the reconciliation process? Yeah, and there were also three other questions regarding Jordan and regarding the effect of religion and regarding um, how can we achieve forgiveness um, in the case without justice. And again, you know, just quickly to touch base on the tribal. Yes, one of the explanation we gave why the Jordanian teachers 
that we interviewed the score low, lower than other was the, stro the strong tribal values identity that continue to be in the Jordanian society, maybe more than the Lebanese and maybe more than the Egyptian. And um, again, uh, the West Bank is more tribal than the uh, Arab Palestinians inside in 48 uh, and the Lebanese. But again, these are some speculation of interpretation that we have had. Religion is, in my view, my hypothesis, yes, religion is essential. Religion is essential for the process of forgiveness in Muslim Middle Eastern context. Not because of the religion only, but because the culture, the culture of the Arab region and the culture of Muslim society is shaped, influenced by Islam, by religion. You don't have to be religious, but you are living in a culture and society that is shaped by religious values. So you, in my view, you cannot take a shortcut. I introduce a secular French model of reconciliation or forgiveness. That is not, that's not gonna work. So yes, religious texts are important, but you don't have to be religious, but you have to know and speak the language of faith when you work with forgiveness and reconciliation in this, in this region. And it doesn't mean that forgiveness is a religious. It means that in this context, religious language is important, but forgiveness in itself and reconciliation is a human rather than one country, one religion, one culture. That's a human drive. That's a human, a human interaction. It can be universal rather than one specific religion. And I'm against the notion that says reconciliation is a Christian thing, as some have argued. And I think that's not, you know, Buddhism is highly you know, develop the sense of forgiveness and reconciliation in Buddhism is highly developed as well. And Hinduism as well. And also in Islam, you find many of these practices. The last example about uh, question was about uh, justice and forgiveness. You don't, you need to, in order to reach a decision of forgiveness, you need to redefine your sense of absolute justice. Absolute justice means I want to punish, inflict punishment. I want the person to pay for the, what their mistake. And I want to repair the damage that happened to me. You need to rethink about this notion of justice in order to be able to forgive. And to redefine to mean, for example, I can define this, you know, I want all of this to happen to forgive, but I am not going to insist on having them in this life. I would like to have them when, you know, when, uh, when we all stand in front of God and we all are accountable for our action. Or God will take, will do the punishment and the, God will help the person to be accountable. By doing this, I reframed my sense of justice. I redefined my sense of justice. I did not give it up. I said, somebody else is gonna take it for me. If other people will do, you know, when uh, their son was killed in a car accident. And they will come and say, I forgive the driver. Why? Because he made a mistake and we all make mistakes. My sense of justice, the the traffic court the court will get the justice but for me i need nothing from him or her that's a redefinition of justice that was not intentional what that was that was not intentional when you hit somebody by a car and he dies that that's one interpretation yes you see we did the research on intentionality and when there is an intentionality involved, it makes it more challenging. 
of course, but it's not a blocking. Sometimes, you know, it was done intentional and you still forgive. But people that we surveyed, they said, if it's intentional, it's more difficult for me, obviously. But does forgiveness at like in this point where the harm was intentional means that you will, you will like overgo or like for, it's not like a forgiveness, but uh, I'll always be suspicious, for example, that that, somebody, that person is going to hurt me again, no matter what. Your son, Even if your son, your son. Yeah. Hit you intentionally to hurt you because he got upset. Will you forgive him? Mother will never yeah, exactly. Mother, 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 like that's mother. mother instinct. Yeah, she will never you see, you see, we, we talk about these things in abstract. But when it comes to real situation, we sit back. So now I said your son. I say your husband. How about your father? Yeah, your father and your mother, they always hit us and sometimes intentional. Will you forgive them? Yeah. Your husband. <laughs> Your husband, you know, your neighbor, your brother, your sister. And then you see, we develop a scale, scale of relationships. And the closer the person to us, the more forgiving we are. True, but also it depends on the severity of the thing. I mean, the harm that is caused by the action. That's right, yes. I, I remember those, I, I put those criteria. The severity, the large, how victim was there, the timing, uh, and the, the relationship that's involved, all of these come in. But I want to release you from, release all of you from the burden of the thought that I am telling you, you should forgive. I am not saying that. It's your decision. But the fact that every one of us is feel guilty when we are not forgiving, says something about our own ways of processing these things. But let's, let's uh, because of time, just uh, let's just go around. And I'm really interested in hearing the response to the question. Are you willing to, this is the group only, this is 12 people here. Are you willing to forgive the person who spoke badly about you and affected your enrollment? Khalid. Let's hear Khalid. Personally, I tend to forgive people, yeah. No, not tend, no, tell me in this case specifically. Yeah, maybe I, I will forgive. Yes, Zina. To be honest, uh, the first time I will not forgive, but I know myself, it takes time, the time heals. So I will forgive, but first, no. Eventually, no. Eventually, <laughs> yes, but immediately, no. No, but with the time, I will be. Okay, go ahead. Uh, uh, oh my God. No one. No one, yes. So my question would be, is it only forgiving the person who talked badly <laughs> about me or like, from the scenario that you gave, my assumption is Professor Liner and Dr. Iyad did not talk to me about it. So they just took the decision without even like talking to me about the what they've heard. So am I we, going to also- We are not talking about them. We're talking about the person. No, but you're you're making a whole a whole story. So for me- <laughs> That it's person, will you forgive them? That person, will you forgive him or her? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Keep for Allah. Abdurrahman. Actually, yes, because um, I had wrote uh, as as uh, I had wrote the Quran, and I believe in Quran that uh, God will uh, inflict his uh, uh, slaves. So this inflection maybe came as like a uh, test for the slave himself to be like for, to, 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 to test him if he will be give, forgive 
and to try to be a positive uh, or take a positive action or he will let's say he will try to be a negative and uh, say no and do some bad things for myself i will think on both sides i will try my best to forgive but also it's not a um, it's not a easy decision actually after the, all the, what he will have in the situation so yes. I think so, yeah, maybe 80% I will forgive him, still 20%, I don't know, actually, depend on situation, you know. But you, do you hear, be you, hear Abd, you hear Abdul Rahman rationalization? He said, this is imtihan min Rabb al-ibad. And that's his rationalization, and that's how he framed it. Despite that framing, he still come up with 80 to 20%. But that's his own framing. So, Wael, we didn't hear from you. Wael Duhan. Uh-huh. Actually, in, in this case, it depends on the details of the problem and in my relation and uh, with with this this uh, this guy. But uh, even if I forgive him, I may not. Uh, he may he may not gain my trust again. So. I may forgive him, but I will not trust him fully. Uh, maybe uh, after that. So, oh, but but you see, this is exa- this is a partial forgiveness. Uh huh. Yeah. This is conditional. You know, I will, I will forgive, forgive, which means I will not insist on punishment. But I don't want to have any relationship with him because I don't trust him. It, 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 maybe it depends on the details, and maybe it depends on the who, who's the, the 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 person. I am. Uh, I mean, in the, I mean, who, who's the one who hurt me or who uh, practiced this uh, uh, bad bad things towards me? But um, okay. yeah, okay. I may, but but maybe I will. He will not gain my trust uh, uh, full full trust. I mean, I will not trust him fully unless he. Prove this uh, maybe uh, later that he can be trusted again. Okay, okay, yeah. Which is the principle of repetition? This, the repetition of wrongdoing. This this story remind me even in our uh, Islamic uh, uh, history. Abu Bakr wa Hadith al Ifk when one of uh, his relatives who, ca- who 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 used to support him. Uh, he he he's the one who came and talked about his his uh, daughter uh, yes. Aisha, and th- then he cut his support towards him. Uh, and after that, the the the, uh, the ayah of Quran came and uh, uh, it said that uh, you should not. Uh, he was innocent. I mean, uh, yeah. No, no, he he was not this innocent actually, but he he uh, the, the ayah said you should forgive and uh, uh, and the, you should not even uh, stop your support towards uh, your uh, re- poor relatives because of this uh, act. Yes, I, I said so, she she was uh, she was innocent and he was guilty. Yes, he was the yes. one. So, so <laughs> it depends. It depends. Not, not everybody is Abu Bakr. So Abu Bakr, yeah, maybe he, he did it because he is. Uh, uh, yeah, but not everybody can can do the same. It depends in the in the in the person and depends in the details uh, of the the story itself. Thank you. So Wael got the key secret. The key secret is to you say it depends. Mm-hmm. And when you say it depends, there is no commitment for forgiveness or reconciliation. In fact, there are no re- ruling for it because it depends is different from every person. And that yeah. makes it more difficult to educate for forgiveness. So if the teacher stands in front of the students in Lebanon and says, do not reconcile with the uh, Shia or with the Sunni or with the Kurds or with the Armenian or with the, uh, you know, with the 18 different sects in Lebanon, unless Druze, unless they said, if they do this and that, the message does not get very clear. The message is reconciliation and forgiveness is far more effective in building peace than conditional punitive 
punishment and competition. That's really what the message that we're dealing with. Um, I really have to go because I have a meeting at 11 in 10 minutes and I have to prepare for my next. But I hope the example illustrated to you, uh, it's not theory only. At the end of the day, it's a personal decision each one of us will have. And you know the politicians cannot force it on us. And even our parents cannot force it on us. It's our own individual uh, mechanism of values and our relationship to that person. So thank you for hosting us, uh, Dr. Iyad, and also Martin. Thank you for uh, this interesting group. And good luck for to all of you in your studies and in your uh, program. And I am sure we'll be in touch again. We can't hear you if you're talking, Ead. Uh, can you hear me now? now yeah. Can... Uh, thank you, Professor, and we thank you very much for attending and giving us this lecture. We are happy to have you as also a professor in our team. You are part of our fellow in Armenia and the pillar of the Armenia. And I thank you so much for being here. And also thank for uh, Dr. Ilham. It was very inspiring what she's doing, practice, because we also encourage our students to develop from theory to practice. So in Armina research PhD program, we just not just do theories, we do research and it's a practical research as well. So we would like as well to be part of us, you know, of uh, organizing those students or maybe supervising some of the students we have, that would be also great. And I thank also Professor Martin Leiner actually with being us, uh, he's uh, the head of the scientific board at Armina. And I thank also Laura who was here with us and all the PhD students who made this a success. This lecture, thank you so much. And, have a good day and enjoy your rest of the day, rest of the week. Thank you all. Thank Have a good day. You. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. And take Thanks. care.